Hi, this is Sebastian Rushworth. Welcome to uh, my new podcast where I talk to the most uh, interesting and original thinkers in health science. My first guest is Malcolm Kendrick, whom uh, many of you will already know. Malcolm is a physician practicing in the UK, and he has a special interest in heart disease and the causes of heart disease. And he's already written two books previously on why the traditional diet, heart, cholesterol, LDL hypothesis of heart disease is wrong and actually not supported by the scientific evidence. And he's just come out with a new book called The Clot Thickens, in which he goes a step further and discusses uh, not just why the cholesterol hypothesis is wrong, but what the evidence suggests actually is the true underlying cause of heart disease. So um, that's what we're going to talk about now. Uh, please enjoy. Hi, Malcolm. So nice to finally get a chance to talk to you face to face. Oh, it's a great pleasure. Um, it's always nice to see what people look like. <laughs> so. I, I think this is your third book on heart disease. Is that right? Third, third and last. <laughs> it's quite hard work writing books. Um, my magnum opus, yeah, my, all, all of my ridiculous thinking brought together. Um, now, the first two were really uh, more critiques of the cholesterol diet heart hypothesis and just basically saying that, you know, the, the, these are not the correct answers. Uh, uh, I recently started saying, you know, if, if heart disease has, it, it's a bit like someone gives you a jigsaw puzzle of, of a thousand pieces sometimes, and throws it on the ground and says, put that together. But they said, but there's two pieces that you must put in the middle. The first piece is saturated fat, and the next bit is raised cholesterol or LDL levels. Those two pieces have to go in the middle. You can't get rid of them, and they're in the middle, and you can't move them. And so, of course, you're then left with all these other pieces that don't actually fit. So you're left with just, it's just impossible to get it together. So when I, you know, once I started looking at it and I thought, well, just let's take these two pieces out, just remove them and say they have nothing to do with heart disease. Well, they're just not important. So what are you left with? And another analogy that I use in the book, and I, and I like it very much, is actually from a French, I believe he's a French mathematician, Henri Poincer. I think that's how you pronounce it. And basically he said that, you know, a scientific hypothesis is made up of stones as a house is made up of stones, if you like. But a pile of stones is, is just not a hypothesis. All you've got is a pile of stones. And what we seem to have with heart disease was we didn't seem to have anything coherent in, in that you know, people will tell you, what are the things that cause heart disease? Well, obviously, there's saturated fat and there's cholesterol there. They're a given. And then you've got, you've got diabetes and then you've got smoking and then you've got lack of exercise. And then you've got whole sorts of other factors around it, like rheumatoid arthritis, for instance, or postcode or, or something like that. And essentially, no one really has made any attempt to try and fit them together into a coherent hypothesis. Is that what caused you to uh, initially develop an interest in heart disease? Just uh, seeing that there were a thousand, a thousand different risk factors, but there was no coherent explanation and that the standard LDL diet heart model was supposed to be at the center of it, but really couldn't explain any of these risk factors. Yes, well, yeah, I think that I, I was interested in part when I was in medical school, a long time before you, uh, Scotland, uh, which is where I was brought up, had the highest rate of heart disease in the world. Uh, and um, so it was of interest if you were doing medicine. And um, I'd also been to France many times and they had one of the lowest rates of heart disease in the world. So I was interested immediately as, well, why, why the difference? And when I looked at it, when it what the standouts were, well, the French uh, eat more saturated fat than the Scots do. Uh, the French cholesterol level was very slightly high, or the LDL level was very slightly higher. And if you looked at all the other risk factors that were considered important, such as your blood pressure, levels of smoking, 
rates of exercise, consumption of vegetables, you know, they actually slightly favoured the Scots. I mean, everyone, as I always said, all oh, the Scottish diet's terrible, but actually, from a purely cardiovascular perspective, and from things like smoking and exercise and obesity and blood pressure, and da -de -da, the Scots were slightly, should have less heart disease. Whereas it was, a, a, at that time, it was around about a fifth of the French rate, it was around about a fifth of that in Scotland. So when you get something like this, you think, this isn't really adding up. There must be something else going on. And, and initially, my idea was that, um, actually, well, what, what do the French do that is obviously different than what the Scots do or the, or the British do? And it struck me that one of the things they do is they, they certainly spend a lot more time cooking and eating as a family. And I wondered if, uh, and I wrote a paper many years ago saying, does insulin resistance or does insulin resistance raise blood sugar levels while eating or just after you've eaten? And that is what's causing the problem because in Scotland, classically, people come home at five o'clock or men came home at five o'clock, demanded to eat, you know, ate, left, went down the pub. And food was very much a, a refueling exercise, whereas in France, food is a very important part of their everyday life. So I just wondered, I originally went down this idea of, well, it, it may be the way that people eat their food rather than what they eat. And there is actually, when you start looking, there's an awful lot of quite interesting work being done on if you are stressed when you eat, then you have stress hormones in your bloodstream. These work against insulin and therefore your blood sugar goes very much higher. Um, so there, there was something there I felt that was worth looking at. And in fact, I went down the whole stress, strain, heart disease route for many years thinking this seems to explain an awful lot. But at a certain point, it doesn't explain an awful lot because you still have things like smoking or systemic lupus erythematosus or, 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 or sickle cell disease or name one of many other things that definitely increase your risk of heart disease. And they didn't fit within that hypothesis at all. So, you know, I moved on from saying, well, and this was where uh, I don't know how well this would translate in, in, in Swedish is that are you looking for the cause of heart disease? The thing. And, and I realized in the end that there is no the thing. It can't exist because it would have been found by now. There are a thing. This is a thing that raises the risk of, of dying of heart disease. Smoking is a factor, you know. Lack of exercise is our factor. Being stressed is our factor. None of these are the factor. And I think this is where a lot of people have got trapped as they've tried to say, I know what the cause is. It's not that. It's this. You know, and I speak to many people who I, who I you know, um, respect, but, but they still, they're looking for their own the cause. And I feel that that's just not ever going to work because there is no the cause. I use an analogy in the book, which is, if you if you want to get rust on the paintwork of your car, well, first of all, you have to damage the paintwork. And the damage can be by many, many different things. You know, a stone, a bush, another car bashing into it, a bicycle, a roof rack falling onto it, running into a bush, you know, a, a shopping trolley, a tin of baked beans landing on the side of your car. All of these things can cause the initial damage to the paintwork that allows it to be exposed, that allows the water and the salt to get onto it and the rust to develop. But if you look at those things individually, you you know, how do you how do you, you know, a roof rack and a and a stone, you know, how do you bring them together? Well you can't bring them together because of what they are, because they are completely different things. You can analyze them until you you can analyze every molecule, you can analyze every every quark in them if you like. It's never going to get you to understand that actually what they do is important, not what they are. And what they do is they damage the paintwork. And in the same way, I looked at heart disease and said, well, what's the first part of the process of heart disease? It's probably almost certainly that you are damaging the lining of your blood vessels. So you made this, uh, I think, very useful analogy with a car and, uh, and uh, how 
lots of different things a shopping trolley a, a can of baked beans uh, gravel can can damage the paintwork uh, and and i guess you describe it like so most of the scientists working in this sphere at the moment are they're all just kind of staring at one of these things they're staring at the tin of baked beans and and there's another group of scientists staring at the shopping trolley and and no one's kind of taking a step back and trying to think about uh, what do all these different things have in common? Um, what was it that caused you to to realize that the thing you want to do, if you the thing you need to do if you want to understand heart disease, is to take this step back and try to understand the bigger picture? Well, it wasn't me. Um, it was a, a very very impressive. Man who sadly died earlier this year called Paul Roche, who actually set up the American Institute of Stress. So I communicated with him a lot because of the, the stress angle. And I was giving a talk, I can't remember what it was. Anyway, he, he came up to me and he said, You know, you know, you have to stop thinking about causes and start thinking about process. I went, What are you talking about? <laughs> and and suddenly like a light bulb went off in my head. I thought, Oh, yes, what he's talking about is this thing. What is the process? What are we looking at? And I think, though, I don't want to dismiss all, all the brilliant scientists in the world as being idiots, but part of the problem has been that the cholesterol hypothesis, the LDL hypothesis, the diet hypothesis has been so dominant, so completely dominant, that, that it's almost been impossible to say, well, let's just get rid of it and look again. So everyone's tried to fit things around these two pieces in the middle of the jigsaw puzzle so of course they've never been able to create a coherent hypothesis because you when you've got the wrong two pieces at the middle you can't it's never going to fit together and yet if you if you are told you cannot move these pieces so people have these tortured i mean here's an example of a tortured thinking is it's considered that there, there are different of course we don't have cholesterol in our bloodstream it's carried around in little spheres called lipoproteins and the one that's thought to cause heart disease is called low-density lipoprotein, which is, say, the size of a football. And they then said, oh, well, they found people who've got high levels of LDL who, um, who, who don't have a high rate of heart disease. So they said, oh, well, something must be protecting them. So they looked at another lipoprotein, which is called HDL, which would be, say, the size of a tennis ball. Maybe not exactly the same analogy. And they said, oh, what this does is it takes cholesterol out of plaques, so it's actually protective. So it was called good cholesterol. So we have bad cholesterol, which is LDL, and good cholesterol, which is LDL. So we no, no longer have cholesterol. We've got good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. And then uh, a population was found in Italy. This is just one example of how this works, which had a, a very low rate of heart disease. They were near, lived near Milan. I can't remember the name of the village now, but and um, very low HDL levels, but almost no heart disease. So it's like, well, that doesn't work, you know. So. They went and they examined it and they said, oh, they've got a particular sort of protein attached to their HDL called APOA1 Milano. All right. They give it a name because it was near Milan. It was called Milano. And um, and they said, oh, this is what's protecting them. It's a super protective form of HDL. So they then went and said, all oh, right, well, we what we're going to do is we're going to find it. We're going to patent it. We're going to start because you can't eat it. You have to inject it. So they're injected it into people and then they said oh this is fantastic look at the, the plaques are virtually disappearing in front of our eyes and then this company was sold to pfizer for a billion dollars on the basis of one small research study on this one apoa one a milano and then it was researched and they found actually nothing happened the, the original research was just nonsense so this has died a death but of course the hypothesis still remains alive because people work out they say well, this is protected, and that's not protective. But we now have a situation where people have looked at the low density lipoprotein and said some people have light and fluffy LDL, which is a nonsense concept. But anyway, they then call that that's really that's that's now good bad cholesterol, all right? And other people have small dense LDL, and that's bad cholesterol, bad bad cholesterol. So we have good bad cholesterol and bad bad cholesterol, and now people have found people with HDL who've got a higher levels of HDL have got a high rate of heart disease. Ah, uh, they said their HDL is bad, good cholesterol. So we've now reached a situation where we can have good cholesterol, 
bad cholesterol, good bad cholesterol, bad good cholesterol, bad bad cholesterol, and good good cholesterol. And and still people are saying this is science. This is just utter nonsense now. I read a paper, I don't know why I bothered it, where, where, where they identified 32 different types of HDL. And some were better and some were worse. It's like, the only reason you're looking at this is because you can't find consistent results of raised LDL and heart disease and low HDL and heart disease. You can't do it because it doesn't exist. But the reason it doesn't exist is these things don't cause heart disease. So you say that you said that not only is LDL not the cause of heart disease, it's not even a cause of heart disease. I, I mean, how 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 is that possible? How 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 can it have become the completely dominant hypothesis and and uh, I guess proponents of the LDL hypothesis would say, well, there are these correlations between a high LDL and, and heart disease. People with uh, familial hypercholesterolemia are more likely to get heart disease. And, and look at statins. They, they lower LDL and they, they lower heart disease. How, how, how would you explain uh, these things and, and how the hypothesis came to dominate so completely if it isn't even a cause of heart disease. Yeah, well, it, it, it began, if you like, in the finding that there was cholesterol. Be careful of that word. There was cholesterol found in atherosclerotic plaques, and this is going back to 1890 or something. Um, and um, and Verkow noted cholesterol crystals in plaques. And uh, so people were saying, right, well, there's obviously a cholesterol thing going on. Not much was made of this, if you like, because heart disease wasn't considered a major problem until pretty much after the Second World War, when people suddenly got interested, because the rate in the United States apparently went through the roof, whether it did or not. And people were saying, well, what's causing it? What's causing it? No one knew. No one really had any ideas particularly. But it was Ansel Keys who came along. Um, he was a researcher in the States. And he said, I know what causes it. If you eat cholesterol, your cholesterol level and your blood goes up, it's, it's it's deposited in your arteries and then you have heart disease. He very rapidly found out that actually cholesterol consumption makes no difference to cholesterol levels in your blood. But of course, cholesterol is a chemical substance. Your cholesterol level in your blood, you have no cholesterol in your blood. Cholesterol is carried around in these lipoproteins. So immediately you've got a problem that the terminology gets in the way. However, having said that, he then said, well, it's not cholesterol that raises your cholesterol levels, it's saturated fat in the diet that raises your cholesterol levels. The two substances are chemically unrelated. They're carried around within these lipoproteins together very often. But then people would say, well, yeah, there we are. We can see that, that, that there was the idea that, that in America had started eating more meat and more fat and therefore they were getting more heart disease. So there was no, there was no absolutely clear cut um, connection. It was just a hypothesis, but it became people liked it because you can see that the plaques look a bit fatty and a bit gungy. They say, "Well, that must have come from fat, and it must have come from cholesterol. That must have been where it came from." This is the level of thinking. All right, this, this, there's no science behind this. If you come up with this hypothesis now, knowing how fat is dealt with in the body, people just said, "Well, that's clearly rubbish." But at that time, nobody knew what was going on. So then, as you came through the 19, it was then discovered that people with high cholesterol levels called familial hypercholesterolemia were more likely to die of heart disease at a young age. And then that was that was worked by Goldstein and Brown, who then found that if you lacked receptors that took LDL out of the bloodstream, your level could go very high and people were dying at a young age. The problem with this is it just happens to be not actually true. Um, the first study I looked at from 1966, quite a major study, said people with familiar hypercholesterolemia, which is genetic raised LDL levels, it should be called hyper LDLemia, live just as long as everybody else. And it's perfectly possible to live into your 70s and 80s. However, there are some people who have a high LDL genetically who are more at risk of dying of heart disease. That is true. There's a small proportion of them. Now, we looked at this research 
And what we found is that they actually the people who have familiar hypercholesterolemia who also have raised blood clotting factors, in other words, their blood is more coagulable, these are the ones that are at the increased risk. The people with FH who do not have the associated, and these things are quite closely located in the genes, if you like. And the other interesting thing is that the LDL um, receptor itself, the thing that locks onto floating LDL and pulls it into cells, and actually that removes blood clotting factors like factor eight from the blood at the same time. It doesn't just do one thing. So in fact, if you have a lack of LDL receptors, you will have higher blood clotting factors in your blood. And it's these things. So you can find, genetically, you can find populations where one, one twin has got a high LDL from familiar hypercholesterolemia. The other one doesn't get the high LDL. They're both at equal risk of dying of heart disease. I can find you as many studies showing no association or negative association as a positive association, which in science means you haven't got an association. But then people say, oh, well, statins lower LDL and they reduce the risk of heart disease. Yes, they do a bit. But moving sideways slightly, you may be aware that there are plenty of drugs that have lowered LDL that have had no impact whatsoever. There was a whole series of drugs. There were four drugs studied called, called TRAPIBs. I'm not even going to tell you how to say them. Five, it's right around five billion dollars was spent on researching these drugs. They raised HDL and they lowered LDL. One of them raised HDL by 120% and it lowered the LDL by 37%, which is exactly what is more potent than most statins. And the impact on cardiovascular disease was exactly and precisely zero. And there, if you like, that would be one of Karl Popper's black swans. Okay, yes, some study, yeah, LDL has been lowered by statins by a certain amount. But statins have many, many different effects. And one of the most important effects that they have is they actually protect the endothelium. We know that they do this. They are anticoagulant as well, quite potent anticoagulants in some cases. And they lower the blood pressure by an amount, probably due to the impact, positive impact they have on endothelium. So they have many off-target effects, which could explain the, what I consider the very minor impacts that they have. But again, if you want to look at it through the lens of, oh, look, they lowered LDL, oh, look, the cardiovascular rate fell a bit, then that's positive support. If you want to look at it another way, you say, actually, it doesn't provide any support at all. And when you look at other drugs that have been given, that have lowered the LDL by as much as statins, you can see no benefit from them. That's, that just means your hypothesis is wrong. So... You know, I look at this and, of course, the, you know, this is this thing, you throw things at you, throw things at you, throw things at you. And it's like, uh, I've likened it to the Hydra, which is the beast from ancient Greek mythology where you chop the head off and it grows another two. You know, every you, you chop the head off the LDL hypothesis, you've got good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. Then you've got good bad cholesterol and bad good cholesterol. Then you've got good good cholesterol and good bad cholesterol. It's like, and it, you just, just this mass of waving heads in front of you and you think, if I attack, if I keep attacking this monster, I'm just going to end up, you know, with a million heads and a billion heads. So I've I, I kind of given up on that. That's why I wrote the book, which is saying, you know, you can have these discussions. They can drain you of all your will to live. Let's create another. Let's look at the other hypothesis and say, does it fit better? Does it explain things better? Does it make sense? Can you fit things into it better? Because no hypothesis is perfect, and I. I we never say this is, but in the end, you're going to say, well, this fits fat. You know, how does sepsis cause heart disease? You know, how does periodontal disease cause heart disease? Well, how does smoking cause heart disease? Smoking doesn't raise your LDL level. You know, so what's it doing? They're all doing the same thing. You know, how does cocaine use increase your risk of heart disease? You can't explain this through the LDL hypothesis. That's what I say. Whereas you can explain it quite easily through. Well, some people go the thrombogenic hypothesis. It's all blood clots. It, it fits perfectly. It doesn't fit here, and it fits here. So which hypothesis are you going to use? The one that fits the vast majority of facts or the one that fits a few facts, carefully selected? You know, that, that's sort of where I'm thinking about it. So, and, and if I understand it correctly, the thrombogenic hypothesis is basically that Anything that 
uh, increases the speed at which endothelium is being damaged or decreases the speed at which endothelium is being repaired is going to uh, increase the rate of atherosclerosis and thereby gradually increase your risk of a heart attack or stroke. Is that it in a nutshell? That essentially is it. I mean, obviously, like anything, there's, there's other bits to it. Like some people have more clotty blood, what you call hypercoagulable. So if they create a blood clot, it's likely to be bigger and more difficult to get rid of. So if you have people, interestingly, people who had haemophilia before the factor eights came along, these people were much more likely, much less likely to get heart disease. Um, you know, so you can add in these things. There's a condition called Hughes disease, which causes increased risk of blood clotting due to, a, you know, this greatly increases your risk of heart disease. So when you see something that increases your blood clotting potential, your risk of heart disease goes up. You see something that reduces your blood clotting potential, your risk of heart disease goes down. I mean, we know that because the drugs that we prescribe to people at risk of heart disease are generally anticoagulants, are they not? Things that reduce the risk of your blood clotting. And in fact, almost everything we do with heart disease when you have an acute heart attack is to do with blood clot management. We try and pull the blood clot out. We try and reduce the risk of it happening again. We, we give people anticoagulants. It's like, well, you know that blood clotting and heart disease are, 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 are like this. You know this. You know, we, we know that plaques enlarge through a, a new blood clot forming on top of it, and then the plaque enlarges. You can find you a thousand studies on this. What, what you won't accept is that the initiation, the thing that starts it, is the blood clot forming on the artery wall. But so that if you like, there's three, there's three steps. We accept step three, blood clot causes heart attack. We accept step two, blood clot causes plaques to enlarge. We do not accept step one, which is the blood clots cause the plaque to start in the first place. Well, then the whole thing fits together rather simply, doesn't it? Rather than saying, oh, it's LDL that causes the plaque to start, then blood clotting takes over. Well, you know, no, essentially. That's just silly. So uh, if the LDL hypothesis is so weak and can only really be held together by the constant addition of different kind of ad hoc patches and the thrombogenic hypothesis is so much stronger in the sense that it fits all the known or most of the known risk factors so much better. Why? And, and I mean, like you say, the thrombogenic hypothesis has been around in one form or another for 150 years. Why is it that the vast majority of doctors still are still so certain that, uh, that uh, LDL is what causes heart disease? Well, the vast majority of doctors, I hate to say it, believe what they're told by their, by their, higher up doctors and uh, the higher up doctors have enormous vested interests in keeping this hypothesis alive uh, when when rose uva statin which was i think the last of the statins to launch in its first year it had a marketing budget of one billion dollars and statin and sales have have been approximately one trillion dollars since their launch we're talking enormous sums of money, and um, and the nutrition industry, the, the low fat industry, that that industry is worth trillions of dollars as well. So, you know, uh, I think a wise American politician once said, "It's very difficult to get a man to believe in something if his livelihood depends on him not believing it." You you talked about uh, LP little A in your book. Um... And, and you mentioned how it's uh, very similar, almost identical, in fact, to LDL, but, uh, but has a, a completely different role that it's actually involved in, in uh, making blood clots more stable. Do you think, um, do you think a, a lot of the support for the LDL hypothesis actually comes from mixing up LDL with LP little a and thinking they're the same thing well i do yes um just explain i try to explain this to people l l ldl is, is obviously the, the lipoprotein low density lipoprotein that carries around fats and cholesterol a high percentage of cholesterol esters within it 
it has an evil twin brother called LPA. They are exactly the same molecule, apart from the fact, if that's only L, LPA has a different protein wrapped to it. So it's got a, a, another protein stuck to it, which is called apolipoprotein A, which is why it's called lipoprotein A. And you think, well, why, why, what is this thing doing? Why is it in the bloodstream? You know, what's its function? Well, the, the, this protein that's attached to LPA, the apolipoprotein A, is actually exactly the same, well, not exactly the same, almost precisely the same as a protein that is incorporated into all blood clots as they form. It's called plasminogen. There's a slight, there's a difference in the way that the, the protein is folded at the end and how proteins are folded has a huge influence on, on what they do in the body. So if it folds that way, it's good, and if it folds that way, it's, it's bad. But actually, the, the structure, otherwise, the chemicals within it are the same. Anyway, when a clot forms, plasminogen is incorporated into all blood clots, and it sits there, not doing very much. But it, it, if it's activated, it turns into plasmin. Um, and the, the activation is a thing called tissue plasminogen activator, which you'll have heard of as and it's known as a clot buster. People are given TPA if they have a stroke in order to bust the clot apart in their brain and allow the blood flow to come back. The reason why TPA works is because it activates plasminogen. Plasminogen turns to plasmin, and plasminogen slices the proteins apart, the fibrin in the clot, and breaks the clot apart. It's called a clot buster. All right. The protein A, protein A is identical to plasminogen, well, virtually identical, except it cannot be activated by tissue plasminogen activator. It actually blocks it. It acts as an inhibitor to tissue plasminogen activator. So if you have LPA and apolipoprotein A within a blood clot, the TPA can't break the clot apart. That's not true of the whole clot, but it tends to be the inner part of the clot is where the LPA is, is concentrated because it is attracted immediately to areas of damage, locks on to the artery wall, and then forms this kind of inner layer bound on. And that bit's very difficult to get rid of, which is which is a good such a good thing. Because if you could shave it away immediately, you just expose the endothelial the, the damaged area underneath another blood clot form, you shave it away another blood clot forms. You just have a sort of ridiculous, pointless blood clot broken apart, blood clot broken apart, so that, that bit of the blood clot doesn't really get broken apart. So that Protein being attached to the LPA. So actually LPA, although it's the same as LDL, apart from this added protein, is not uh, it's not a substance designed to transport cholesterol and fats around in the body. It's part of your blood clotting system. You mentioned the stress and, and that stress causes uh, heart disease. And I guess that uh, that means that this kind of stereotype of uh, of the type A uh, personality getting heart disease, which I always thought was nonsense, that there might actually be something to it. And and you also talk in your book about uh, mental illness and how mental illness can cause heart disease. And, and how, well, how is that possible? How can something that's happening in our mind uh, cause, cause something to happen in our arteries? Aren't those two completely separate systems? I think they're not. And I think that... Um... You know, we all know ourselves, if you're feeling ill, you, you can feel depressed and upset. So, I mean, the, the mind-body connection is something Western medicine has, has long since, if you like, dismissed. But it, it, there are clear cut. If you don't want to think of it, I don't know, it's like mystical, you know, um, Far East kind of Buddhism and meditation ideas that, that you can see very clearly that people who are mentally stressed or have things like PTSD, you can measure the fact that they're the system that deals with stress. We call it, which call it the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. So if, if someone points a gun at you, you will light up, right? And you'll be frightened. And as you do that, stress hormones go through your system, your heart rate goes up, your blood vessels constrict, constrict. you release stress hormones like cortisol and adrenaline and growth hormone and all sorts of things, glucagon. And, and also there's a, a, an unconscious nervous system in your body called the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems that come out of your brain and travel down your spinal cord and go into all your organs. So when you're under stress, for instance, some of the sympathetic system will tell your liver to start producing more blood clotting factors. Because if you are in danger of, of harm, you want your blood to clot, you want your blood, your blood pressure to be going up, you want to 
all sorts of things are going on. Now that's clearly quite a good thing, and, and, and it can be good for you in the short term. You know, people like going on on um, on funfair rides where they're frightened by a big drop, or and people like scaring themselves because it gives them a buzz. That's fine. These are good things. These are positive things. The problem comes when you are continuously, chronically stressed, if you like. So people who suffer from racism are continuously bullied. They're continuously manipulated by their bosses. They may not get a pay rise. They get shouted at. They they are continuously in a in a threat situation. And when people are continuously in a threat, out of control situation, the system is continuously, chronically activated. This means that basically all sorts of things start to go wrong in their what they call the neurohormonal system. At its most extreme, schizophrenia is a state of, if you like, hyper alertness and hyper anxiety a lot of the time. People with uh, schizophrenia, their rate of death from heart disease is astronomical. They develop also they develop diabetes much more rapidly because if you have these alert systems going on all the time, the alert hormones and the alert sympathetic system is directly antagonistic to insulin around your body. So um, naturally the insulin starts to not work so well and your blood sugar level starts to rise so you develop diabetes. In fact it was noticed in the First World War following, they used to call it shell shock rather than PTSD. So troops who were just unable to go to fight because they were just shaking with anxiety and fear. In these cases what they found was that these these troops were actually, if you measured their urine, they were they had sugar in their in their urine. In other words, that's quite a severe sign of type two diabetes, and that's because of the anxiety levels that were going on. And people who are depressed, you can see that people who are depressed, you can develop type two diabetes due to severe depression. We know this is the case; it doesn't happen to everybody. And you can measure their resistance to insulin goes shooting up, and once the depression goes, their insulin resistance falls. There's a whole series of nasty things going on in your system if you are under chronic stress. Stress that you can control, stress you can get away from is okay. It's a good thing for people to get a bit stressed and a bit anxious, but people who are constantly under stress. So you look at populations, I say, if you look at countries with the highest rates of heart disease or populations with the highest rates of heart disease, these are, these are populations under stress. The, the population with the highest rate of heart disease is Australian Aboriginals. And you can measure their stress responses, and they're severely dysfunctional. They develop a high rate of type 2 diabetes. They develop all sorts of other chronic conditions at a much younger age. And then they develop heart disease. Why? Because, well, things like having a raised cholesterol, uh, cortisol level, having, having a highly stimulated sympathetic system, does all sorts of things to your metabolism that are not good. And one of the things is it directs fat storage to your abdomen, so you become centrally obese, so you develop visceral fat, which has metabolic problems associated with it. Your blood clotting systems are awry, you know. So this it's just a whole series of these are not disconnected things; they're all connected, if you like, to the same process of you're in a kind of hyper alert warning system. It's not just heart disease it causes; you can see that it causes people to have cancer and all sorts of unpleasant things, but the heart disease is, is there. So when I, I looked at um, um, heart disease rates in 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 Russia, that's only in Lithuania, when the uh, when the um, when the war came down in eighty nine, the rate of heart disease in in Lithuania was gradually falling, and then the war came down in eighty nine, the rate of heart disease doubled over a two year period. Shot it doubled, right. and then it came down again over about another three or four year period, and then it's back where it was. And you can see the same thing happening across the Soviet Union when the when the wall came down, although communism wasn't a perfect system in any way, it was an enormously stressful time. And you can see in Russia itself, it was actually two years later when the Soviet Union broke up completely. The rate of heart disease in Russia doubled over a two year period, came down, went up again very rapidly in 1999. See so what happened in 1999, there was a huge economic crisis on the ruble and people's savings were destroyed. So you can see in Russia is this pattern of social dislocation, social upset, social stress, very rapidly followed by astronomical rates of heart disease. 
So um, we've been talking for an hour and a half now. I guess we should probably start to wrap things up. But uh, I, I have this one last question, which is, uh, uh, so what can people do to protect themselves from heart disease? Well, I think that many of the things are the same things that, that you've been told. You know, um, Take exercise. This is good. Um, don't smoke. This is good. Avoid pollution, if you like. This is good. These are the same standard things that, that other people have said to you. There are certain things, specific things that are covered in the book. But your general things are, if you're having a terrible job and you're being bullied and you're having a terrible time, try and get out of that. If you've got a, you know, you're finding that your life is, is, is difficult for you and stressful for you, got to look at ways of improving that. You just create good social networks. The book, The Blue Zones, which I haven't discussed, but it's places in the world where people live longer than anywhere else. The overriding important thing seems to be good network of, of social of friendships, of people that you can trust, of social networks. These are hugely important things. Are they the most important? Possibly. If if you're developing diabetes, that's a bad one for a lot of people. And in this case, while I haven't really discussed diet, if you're developing diabetes and you think you need to look at your diet, you need to reduce your carbohydrates intake and you need to increase your fat intake. And then the type of exercise that you need to do if you're developing diabetes is what they call short burst exercise, high intensity. Because this burns up your sugar levels very quickly and allows your blood sugar level to come down. If you're not overweight, you're not diabetic, you don't need to worry about these things. But from a population basis, this is very, very important. There are some supplements that are beneficial. I don't think I've covered them in the book, but I think the general things are, are, are relatively straightforward, if you like. Um, and they're not that different from what, what other people have, you know, what, what your, your doctor will tell you. What I do say is, you know, don't take, <laughs> don't take medications unless you are absolutely have to. Because in the end, these things can do you more harm than good. You know, you're not going to get health from taking two tablets a day. It's going to come from what you do for yourself, if you like. Okay, I guess we're gonna. It's time for us to wrap up then. Thank you so much, Malcolm, for talking to me. Uh, I really enjoyed your book, The Clot Thickens. I'm sure a lot of people listening will uh, want to read it after this conversation. And I loved all your other books too, uh, Stat in the Nation, the the Cholesterol Con, Doctoring Data. They're all excellent, all well worth a read. So. Uh, and, and for your excellent blog as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sebastian. Much appreciated. Guess what? What you just listened to was only about half of the full interview. If you want to get access to the full uncut version, then you'll need to sign up as a patron, which you can do at uh, patreon.com slash Sebastian Rushworth. Apart from getting access to the full uncut versions of the interviews I do, patrons also get access to my private discussion forum and all the interesting conversations happening there and also get the ability to send me private messages. I always respond to messages I get from my patrons. So please sign up at patreon.com slash Sebastian Rushworth.